Well, I did a Google search this week, and I don't know if you've ever done a Google search where you just started something and then you're looking for the drop-down menu of the options that Google gives you. I started my Google search with help me, and the first thing that came up was make it through the night. I was like, whoa. Whoa. Which, actually, that's a song, I think, apparently. Maybe some of you know that. That's a song, Help Me Make It Through the Night. The next option was Help Me Hold On, which is actually another song. And there was like a, a, a theme here. You know, that's a old, good old Travis Tritt. He was rocking the mullet before the mullet was cool. Help me help you. Help me help you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Jerry Maguire. Okay, my wife didn't know that one. I was like, babe, come on. Jerry Maguire, help me help you. Help me, Jesus. Okay, we're in church. We finally got a, a churchy answer. And then the last one was help me, Rhonda. <laughs> help me, Rhonda. Help, help me, Rhonda. I mean, that's what people are searching for. Like, when they need help, they are looking to Rhonda. How many of us asked for help at some point this week? Just curious. Raise your hand. Did you ask for help at some point this week. All right, hands down. How many of us might admit that we needed help, but we didn't ask for it? Okay, yeah. Some of you are willing to raise your hands. It might be more than that, but you're not going to admit that either. The reality is we can be really independent, can't we? I mean, you know this. If you've got toddlers in the house, any of you parents, you're like, let me help you, please. And they're like, no. I'm going to do it myself as I, you know, throw food everywhere. Or, you know, I'm going to put my shoes on myself. An hour later, you're like wanting to leave that, you know, right? Like we get this independence thing. Sometimes we don't ask for help until we've really made a mess of things. One of my new favorite books is a book by Charlie Maxey called The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse. Has anybody heard of this book? This is a beautiful book book, handwritten, like hand-lettered, hand-drawn by the author. Uh, There's some incredible drawings in here. This is about a boy who seems to be alone, who's journeying through life with some new friends, these animals that he meets on on his journey, the mole, the fox, and the horse. And there are these beautiful snapshots of conversations that the boy is having with these different animals from their different perspectives. And it's these little glimpses of wisdom that are being shared between the boy and the animals, the animals and the boy. It's a beautiful uh, book. It's really not quite a story because it doesn't have a beginning and an end, but it's just kind of, it's a journey. And every now and then you get a snapshot of something someone said in the conversation, but the picture draws draws you in to just imagine what the rest of the conversation might have been like. At one point in the book, the boy meets the horse, and the boy asks the horse, what is the bravest thing you've ever said? To which the horse responded, help. Help is the bravest thing he had ever said. Then he goes on to say this, and I have a picture of this quote. Asking for help isn't giving up, said the horse. It's refusing to give up. I love that. Asking for help isn't giving up. It is refusing to give up. And we all need help in some way or another this morning. And I hate to break it to you, but we're not going to get it from Rhonda. (laughs) So we're going to turn to God's word. Romans chapter 8. We've been walking through This chapter, one of the greatest chapters in all of the Bible, we've been seeing that God's grace is greater than we think. The gospel of Jesus Christ is greater than we could ever imagine. The life that we're given through the Holy Spirit of God is greater than the life we are offered from anywhere else in the world. Romans 8, we're picking it up in verse 26. I'm going to read verse 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, 
because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now, if you've been with us throughout these last few weeks, you know the Holy Spirit has played a pretty pivotal role in Romans chapter 8. And then, and then we had a couple of weeks where we were talking about some other things. Paul took a little sidebar to describe some other things that are going on in the world around us. And now the Holy Spirit has sort of re-entered the chat. The, the Spirit does a lot of things for us. And, and Paul's covered a lot of them in Romans chapter 8. I've got a rundown for you. Verse 2, the law of the Spirit of life sets you free from the law of sin and death. Verse four, the spirit helps us fulfill the just requirement of the law, which is summed up later in Romans 13 as love. Verse six, the spirit gives us life and peace. Verse 11, God's going to raise us from the dead by the spirit who dwells in us. Verse 13, the spirit helps us put to death the deeds of the body. In other words, helps us make war on our sin. Verse 14, The sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. Verse 15 and 16, the Spirit bears witness in us that we are children of God. Verse 23, we have the first fruits of the Spirit, which is the guarantee of our final redemption. And now here in verse 26 today, we see that the Spirit is helping us. And Paul starts these two verses by saying, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. If you're just joining us today, we're sort of parachuting down in and Paul's saying likewise, and we need to kind of understand from context what this means. What he's saying here as he says likewise is in the same way, just as hope in our future glory, which was a few verses before, we talked about this last week, just as hope in our future glory sustains us and enables us to, to, to wait eagerly and with patience and endurance in the midst of all the suffering in our lives, In the same way that hope helps us, now the Spirit helps us. If you're taking notes, you've got it on the bulletin there, the the verses, or you've got your Bible open, or maybe on your phone, if you can circle that word helps. That five-letter word in English is a 17-letter whopper of a word in the original language. This is where, this is one of those times when a little bit gets lost in translation. Sinanti lambanomai. That's a big mouthful of a word for which we read helps. It's a compound word. It's made up of a root word and two prefixes. And in Greek, when you want to intensify a word, you front load it with prefixes. So this word in the original is basically bolded, it's cap locked, it's highlighted. The root word here, lambano, means to lay hold of something to grab it in your hands so you can carry it. Paul is saying that the Holy Spirit of God lays hold of us powerfully and pulls us along. He's carrying our burdens with us. This particular usage of the word only occurs one other place in our Bibles. It's in Luke 10, verse 40. You might remember the story. Martha and Mary, they're having Jesus over and, you know, Martha is trying to do all the work and Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet. Martha's getting frustrated. And this is what she said, verse 40, Martha was distracted with much serving. And as she went up to Jesus, she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to, Sananti Lambano Mai, tell her to help me, join me in the work. Now, this is a help that's different than the help that my kids want when they ask me to help them with their homework. Because they're like, Dad, I need help with my homework. And I come in and they're like, you know, they point to the problem and I read it. And as I start to help them like process through it, they're like, no, no, no. What's the answer? You know, just do it, Dad. <laughs> right? Like, just tell me what the answer is. That's the kind of help they want. This kind of help that we're seeing right here is the help that I got from so many of you a few weeks ago when we were moving into our new home. Specifically, when we were moving a very large and heavy dining room table, which I could not move on my own. And as I'm trying to move it uh, from my garage, which is where a few of you had had dropped it off, into my house, I'm struggling when, 
when up walks Kyle Casey's biceps. And uh, if, you know, if you know him, you know that that was a very welcome sight. He then grabs a hold of the table and helps me carry it into the house. Now, here's where the analogy breaks down because actually I think Colby and some other guys walked up too. And so I just sort of like backed away and then <laughs> they carried my table into my house. I was supervising, you know, uh, as they figured out how to get it through the door and carry it into the house. They were helping me carry my burden. This verb is in the present tense. That's why we read helps in the English. It means that the Spirit is constantly, continually, in every moment, helping us. And Paul says he's helping us in our weakness. Last week we talked about verses 18 through 25. We talked about the sufferings of this present time. Our weakness being all the sickness and the futility and the frustration and the decay and the heartache that we encounter in this life on our way to heaven. But more specifically, Paul connects this weakness to the next phrase. He says, for we don't know what to pray for as we ought. When we suffer a terrible loss or a devastating setback, we receive heartbreaking news. We have no words, no idea what to say, no idea where to start, no idea what to pray. We know how to pray. We, Jesus taught us to pray our Father in heaven. We know that everybody ends their prayers with in Jesus' name, amen. But what do we pray especially in those moments of our weakness. Because we've all experienced that physical weakness. When we're just too tired to pray, when we're exhausted from our struggles. We've experienced that emotional weakness. When we're too discouraged, when we lose heart and we just give up on praying. We've all experienced the spiritual weakness. When we feel too disconnected from God, too ashamed, we have blown it. There's no way he wants to hear from me. I have no idea where to even start or what to say. My whole sinfulness is a weight on me, and I don't know how to pray as I should. Paul says the Holy Spirit's helping us. How is he helping us? Verse 26, the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Last week we saw that God's creation is groaning as it's waiting to be set free from its bondage to decay because of the sin of the world. We saw that even God's people who now celebrate that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, God's people who even have the Holy Spirit in their lives, even God's people groan. And now we see that even the Spirit of God is groaning. Paul says the Spirit of God is interceding on our behalf. What does that mean? Well, it literally means that you are pleading someone's case on their behalf in front of a superior. You are literally standing in the gap and pleading the case for someone who's too weak, someone who needs help. They can't plead their own case. And I imagine you've been there. You've done this. You've pled the case of someone else. Perhaps you've gone to the Father on their behalf. Perhaps you've gone to uh, a coworker on someone's behalf. Maybe you went to a teacher on behalf of your child and you pled their case. Someone has pled your case on your behalf. And again, this verb is in the present tense, which means it's continually happening. The Spirit is always representing you before God the Father. Did you know that you actually have not one, but two divine intercessors? You have the Holy Spirit here in verse 26. And then later on in Romans 8, in verse 34, you see that you have the Son of God interceding on your behalf. Romans 8, 34 who is to condemn? In other words, who can condemn God's people? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding 
for us. So Jesus is in heaven right this very moment pleading your case, pleading his perfect righteousness on your behalf. And why does he have to do that? Well, because the Bible teaches us, it's in Revelation 12, we're actually gonna get there the week after Easter. We see that Satan is known as the accuser. He's accusing you of every sin. He's accusing you of every careless word. He is accusing you and pointing out every little lie, every broken promise, every failure to serve someone else or obey the commands of God. He stands to accuse you, but you have an advocate. 1 John 2 verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, I'm glad he put that one in there, right? If anyone does sin, and we will, and we do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I love that. So Jesus is refuting and rebutting all the accusations that are being hurled against you. So you have two attorneys who have never lost a case, one in heaven and one on earth dwelling within you. So back to Romans 8, 26. Paul says the Holy Spirit's praying for you. Holy Spirit's pleading your case with groanings too deep for words. When you carry someone else's burden with them, you groan. When you carry a friend's bedroom furniture to the third floor of his apartment, you groan. The Holy Spirit feels the burdens of our lives. I wonder if that feels like a stretch to think the Spirit of God is groaning, feels the burden. Well, Jesus felt those things. Hebrews says that Jesus is a high priest who's able to sympathize with our weaknesses. We just saw those words come across the screen moments ago. Jesus was on his face in Gethsemane, sweating blood under the burden of knowing he was about to pay for all our sin. Paul says the Spirit's groanings are too deep for words. It literally means unspeakable. Speechless, silent. This is not, by the way, as some people might teach, pointing to ecstatic utterances or unintelligible noises that begin to bubble up inside of us and then come out of our mouths. But these groanings do have content. They do have meaning. They do have purpose. So how are the Spirit's deep, unspeakable, speechless groans heard? And to whom is the Spirit speaking? Romans 8, 27. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Who is he who searches hearts? God, the Father. God the Father, 1 Samuel 16, 7, very familiar verse. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks where? At the heart. Psalm 139, David prayed, God, you have searched me and you know me. The Father searches our hearts and he knows the mind of the Spirit. He knows what the Spirit intends. The Holy Spirit is pleading our case in this wordless communication from his own mind to the mind of the Father. And God knows what's on it because the triune God lives in perfect union. And they're on the same page. They're singing from the same song sheet. They're running the same play. And that play is, Paul says, the perfect will of God. That's what the Spirit's praying for you right this very moment. Because in your weakness, you don't always know God's perfect will. You don't know why this suffering has entered your life right now. You don't know what God is doing or how he's going to use it. 
And so you don't know what to pray. Do we pray for healing? Do we pray for strength to endure? Do we pray for a way out? Do we pray for wisdom and insight to stay in? We don't always know what to pray, so the Spirit of God in us does. And he's always praying in accordance with God's will. And we can all be encouraged because in all of our weakness and our sickness and our loss and our struggle, the Spirit of God is praying for us, not against us. Always praying for you. Always pleading your case. Always moment by moment praying for God's perfect will. And we never hear it. Though we do sometimes hear the Spirit leading us in prayer. So let's leave Romans 8 for just a moment. And let's flip over to Ephesians chapter 6. So far we've seen that the Holy Spirit is kind of like an app on your phone. It's always running in the background. And I, if you're not an iPhone user, I don't know what to do with you. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm kidding, sort of. Um, but I don't know if this works the same way. But on my phone, on my iPhone, I'll sometimes get notifications like, this app's running in the background. Are you cool with that? And I'm like, I don't know. What are you doing? You know, like, but they're tracking us, you know? Like, you don't even know that it's running. It's tracking your location. It's sending and receiving data. The Holy Spirit is kind of like that with the Father. The Teague family has this app called Life360. It's pretty awesome. It's always running in the background. I can use it to locate my family at any moment. I can see where they are. I can see where they've been. I can see where my 16-year-old's gone and how fast she drove to get there. And I'm thinking, man, what would my life have been like if my parents had that? The Holy Spirit's leading you and guiding you and directing you every moment, and you don't always know it. But sometimes you do. Sometimes you do. In Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul is writing to the Ephesians about the armor of God. And in verse 10, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Paul's whole point in this section of that letter is that we're in a spiritual fight. And so we put on the armor of God so we can stand against our enemy. And after talking about the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword of the Lord, he goes on to say this in verse 18. He says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication. That's just requests for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. This same phrase, in the Spirit, is the one that Paul used back in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, when we talked about being in the Spirit, how that's like being in the current, being in the flow, or in the power, or the sway of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit helps us by praying even when we're not praying, praying the will of God even when we don't know the will of God, and God is hearing those prayers, but the Holy Spirit is also teaching us how to pray, like that app running in the background. And every now and then, when we're paying attention, sometimes even when we're not, it's like a notification will pop up. And the Spirit of God is alerting you. Pray this right now for them. You ever experienced that? You're sitting there in the morning, maybe you got your Bible in your lap, a coffee, a cup of coffee in your hand, and and perhaps you're just, you're praying, or you've got a moment of stillness, and then God brings someone to mind. You're driving down the road, and then kind of out of nowhere, someone comes to mind, and you just have this burden, like, I need to pray for them. Or a verse from God's word will come to your mind related to that person. And then maybe you pick up the phone, and you call them, or you, you shoot them a text, and they're like, oh my gosh, your timing's perfect. To which you respond, God's timing is always perfect. He always sees us. 
you've become an intercessor on behalf of someone else. Now you're pleading their case before God the Father, which is pretty cool to think about. God the Spirit is leading you to petition God the Father in the name and the authority of God the Son. And this is how the will of God is accomplished here on earth as it is in heaven. Last week in our life group, we had a moment like this. We had a smaller uh, gathering, and so I just said, hey, let's take some time here at the end, and let's pray for a couple of these things that were mentioned tonight. And here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to invite the Spirit of God to teach us how to pray, to lead us in what to pray. And as we sat there for a moment, I just, I just knew, because it came out of nowhere, God wanted me to anoint this person with oil and to pray very specifically over them because of some things that I know are going on in their lives. And I felt like in that moment, the Lord just wanted me to pray that they would not be afraid to hope. And when I said that, the dam broke. The Spirit of God knew exactly what to say to that child of God. And I got the blessing of just being a part of it, to come before the Father and intercede on their behalf. When we do this in community with one another, you guys, it's incredible. It's such a beautiful picture of fellowship. The Spirit of God always knows what to pray. And that will always be for us. And it will always resonate deep within us. So what? This week I was meeting with some other pastors in this area. And we were just, we were praying for one another. And uh, there there was a, a guy there, his name's Danny. And he was sharing with us that his wife's really been struggling uh, health wise and and it's really been a, a, a difficult road for them. Um, she has Crohn's disease. And if you, if you suffer from that or you know someone who does, you just, that's just difficult. It's hard. It's frustrating. It's discouraging. And he said, I'm just so thankful to be here right now because being around people who pray, this is where I have to be. And I thought to myself, I want Two Rivers Church to be a people who pray. I want Two Rivers Church to be a people who pay attention, who ask the Spirit to lead us and teach us how to pray so that His perfect will is done and we get to join Him in it. I want us to be a people who pray for big things pleading one another's case before the Father. Which, by the way, is what we're going to do next Tuesday at the office. I think it's April 5th, I believe is the date. We gather there once a month, first Tuesday of the month, at the office, and we worship together, and we pray together, and you're all invited. The bravest thing you could ever say is, help, pray for me. Don't give up. Don't be afraid of hope. Don't be afraid to pray, even when you don't know what to pray. The spirit within you does. One of the other beautiful truths about this word today is that if you're a follower of Jesus, you're getting help every moment of every day. You're getting help from the spirit within you, praying for you, but also you're getting help from Jesus, your savior in heaven, who's pleading your case amidst the onslaught of all the accusations. And and some of you are consciously aware of what those accusations probably are. All the charges that could be brought against you. And the good news for those who know Jesus is that you'll never be condemned for those charges. You'll never be lost or cast out once you've been rescued and adopted. Jesus won't allow it. 
He's guarding your soul. He's securing your salvation. He's pleading your case on his own merits. And his prayers are always answered. But without him, you're on your own. You'll face those charges and you'll have to plead your own case. So let me ask you, do you know that you have an advocate in heaven? Do you know that someone's pleading your case for you? And if you're unsure of that today, would you take this moment to surrender, to plead guilty before the God who knows your heart and then to receive forgiveness and cleansing for every sin, every accusation, every charge and receive the confidence and the assurance that he will always be for you. That's my invitation to you today. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you that you've sent your spirit to dwell within us, reminding us that we are your children, reminding us that we are loved, calling us back when we wander away, picking us back up when we trip and fall down. You're praying for us always. We thank you for the help that you have given us. God, I have two prayers right now. One is that we who know you and call Jesus our Lord and Savior, who are your adopted children, that we would hear your spirit speaking, prompting, guiding, leading, encouraging, challenging, convicting us. God, I want to be a people who are listening and paying attention to that so that we can join you in what you're doing in our lives, but also in the lives of others. God, give us ears to hear your voice and the courage to step into it. God, I pray that we would be a church that intercedes on behalf of one another, that we believe you answer prayer, and that we would believe that you do big things. And Father, my other ask this morning is that you would make someone very aware right now of their need to have an advocate in heaven refuting every charge against their soul. And that you would give them the courage and the faith to say, I trust you today. If that's you this morning, Tell him you trust him. You need Jesus to rescue you. His death on the cross paid for your sin. His resurrection vindicated all his claims about who he is and promises us resurrection life forever. Receive that invitation today and have the assurance your salvation. God, we thank you for this time to be together and to be in your word. We pray that as we leave here today, we have our antennas up for that app that's running in the background. And we invite you to break in with as many notifications as you want. and Lead us and guide us and direct us. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven for your glory and our good. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.